I'd like to preach to you the message, three people that we should not allow at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Three people, I've told several people this, this is a bizarre message. I would never have collected the three thoughts that I'm going to share with you this morning on my own. If I didn't preach verse by verse, you would be assured that I was talking about people in our church. If I didn't, and, and, if, and if we didn't preach and you didn't see the phrases in the very word of God, you would, you would think, how in the world did he collect these three phrases and put them together? It's a bizarre sermon. But it is, thus saith the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll preach three people that we should not allow at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Father, please put your hand upon this sermon as it is the fairy phrases of the word of God. And I pray that you would bless your word. Sometimes that means that your word is preached and, and a stone wall hears it like Isaiah's audience. And sometimes thousands turn to the Lord as Peter's audience. But you accomplish what you want to accomplish and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Nearly every week I meet people in stores, perhaps, or in restaurants, different places, parks, or whatever, that I invite to come to Lighthouse, to our church. I personally believe it is not the only church, but it is one of the best churches in America. I do. I do. I, I just do. It doesn't matter at all to me what these people are wearing or the color of their hair or how many tattoos they have. I just want them to know from my heart that they will certainly be welcome with Jesus' love in this place, that they will be told salvation that they, it will be explained to them out of the very word of God what God expects for their lives. All people are welcome. I hope that they all come. Although this is my practice, and I hope it is yours. I want you to know today in our scripture that the Bible clearly points out three types of people that we should never allow to remain in our church. If you take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, we continue preaching verse by verse through this book of Hebrews, and we've come... At the end of a, uh, a great illustration about the marathon of the Christian life, we've come to verse number 15 through verse number 17. As we stand, we soberly look at God's word, thus saith the Lord. Beginning verse number 15. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail, that word means come short. It's translated in our New Testament in other places, the same word, come short. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. You may be seated. Beginning in verse number 15, we go to the end of the message. You may be seated. Everyone may be seated. All right. Very good. We go to the end of the book of Hebrews. We end it by coming to these phrases, these thoughts. Verse number 15 begins this slope. It begins wrapping up the whole book of Hebrews. There's only one chapter left, and it's kind of parting words. This very Jewish, Jewish book taught us from chapter 1. Now, you've got to get it. Quick wrap up, and then we'll get a quick review, and we'll get right to the sermon. Chapters 1 through chapter 10 taught us that Jesus is better than any religious thing this world has to offer or that any other system has to offer. Jesus is sufficient for everything our life needs, especially Eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Jesus is better than anything. I see some of you got that far side look here. You're already like in la-la land. All right, I said Jesus is better than anything. Okay, clear. Let's hone in on this. Chapter 11, that was chapter 1 through 10. Chapter 11 taught us what it was to walk by faith in Christ after we've received him as our Savior. And the promises that he gives to us of reward if we walk by faith. Chapter 12, the chapter we're in, Begins by laying out a great marathon of the Christian life. It, is taught, it taught us of the struggles and the hurdles of this life that may even come from the chastening of the Lord. Not only, only from the devil, but even from the chastening of the Lord, trials and troubles come. Because he loves us. And just like the verse we sang, the fire is designed many times to, to burn away the dross in our life that we would come forth as gold. 
You probably didn't hear it, but in our prelude before the message, Shelley was, pray, was playing Rejoice in the Lord, the song by Ron Hamilton. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Chapter 12 at the beginning taught us to praise the Lord for the trials of chastening and how to make straight or level paths for our feet. Now you're totally up to date. And in verse number 15, there is a notable difference of the audience that God is talking to. Up to this point, it has been to individual believers. And begin, beginning in verse number 15 and continuing on, he opens the scope of that audience. And instead of talking very specifically how you need to run your Christian race, he opens it up to the church as a collective body of things that we are supposed to do. And he begins talking to us as a whole collective body. In these verses, you'll see it in the, the language and even in the way that, that the pronouns are used. You'll see it that it's an open idea, that it's not just talking to, your, to you specifically now, but all of us together would do these things. There are three people here, beginning verse number 15, that we should not allow to remain at Lighthouse at our local church. Number one. We must not allow anyone to be in our church that falls short of receiving salvation by grace. Look at verse number 15, the first part. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Talking to us collectively now as a church that we should look diligently among the professing body of Christ. Lest any man should fail of the grace of God. I don't mean if there's anyone who fails that we ought to kick them out. I mean if there's anybody who is failing or coming short of understanding how to be saved by grace, we ought to get them saved. Amen. We ought to at least reach out to them and explain clearly what it means to be saved by grace. Amen. Notice the verse is very urgent. It says, and look at verse 15, looking diligently. It doesn't just say do this. I mean, this is an urgent thing. It's a hard thing for the Lord to understand that in his local churches there are those who do not get it. Who are those who do not understand what it means to be saved by grace. Look diligently. That is the word bishop in the Bible. To oversee, not the office like a pastor to oversee, but to oversee that each one of you sitting out there would oversee these 250, 260 people around you and in the overflow. And you would diligently search out if any man or woman does not understand what it means to be saved by grace, that you would diligently, how sad it would be, if a group of people from Lighthouse Baptist Church would die and go to hell. How sad it would be. We are to look over the church and see if there's someone among us that may profess salvation but are failing or coming short of salvation. Notice in verse number 15, the word is to fail. It is the exact word that is used in a very popular verse that we use when we tell people about Christ. For all have sinned and yell it out. What is it? Come short. It's the exact word. To fail here does not mean that God's grace will save you and then fail somewhere along the way. That you'll lose your salvation. It means that you come short of understanding how to be saved by grace. Lest someone in our midst that comes to church over and over and over would hear every message, every sermon, somehow, every, every Sunday we try to give the gospel of grace. But someone through entertainments of roast beef eating afterward or of, of agitation or of the idea of just putting in their punch card for religion and sitting here and they like the singing, and they like when things happen and they like the ladies singing and stuff would fail to get it. Oh, that no one ever in our church who comes here for any period of time would not understand that salvation is by grace. It doesn't have anything to do with someone who hasn't heard the gospel either. It doesn't mean that anyone should fail. It means those that sit under the gospel, that hear it, but yet they fail to be saved by grace. Grace is the most important word in salvation thinking. The whole plan of salvation can be wrapped up in that one word, grace. It is the sweetest word ever uttered, grace. You cannot go to heaven without receiving grace. God's grace means this, and perhaps it's, you, you need to understand, and please focus in. It is not a general idea. It's not a religious word at all. It means that God gave men salvation, that God did it all, that I can do nothing. Grace, by its own meaning, is something that is free. That's something that is a gift. 
It is grace when you are given something without any strings.